because it was Sierra's birthday, she got to pick where we went. And she picks out the only Cambodian restaurant that exists in Gainesville, which is in the sketchiest part of Gainesville. Um, our family has this thing about finding the scariest places to go eat. And sometimes you are surprised by what you get to eat. If you ever get to Bandit Keith's is a hole in the wall kind of pub that you end up eating upstairs most likely and get the vegetable artisan's platter there. It is to die for. I mean, it was phenomenal. Anyway, back to the Cambodian restaurant. So here we all are. Um, it's the whole family and we're all sitting at the table and we're having a great time. We're not just the only ones having a great time because the cooks, who you can see the kitchens right there, it's one of those open kitchens, they're right there. Fact is, all three of the cooks are also the busboy and everything else, so either they're cooking or they're bringing something out to you. They were having a great time with us. So we get to the end of the meal and the guy walks up that started it all off and he goes, okay, I have the check. I said, I got it. You got it for all of them? Yeah, I got it for all of them. Do you always smile like this when you got it for all of them? I said, yeah, of course I do. You're a good man. <laughs> Think about that. Think about why he would say that at the end of a meal. Okay, maybe he's after a bigger tip. <laughs> or think about why he said that and what caused that. Don't think about me. Think about a person responding that way after they've been interacting with a group of people. And the reason why, I'm going to bring that up at the end. I'm going to bring up the songbook, and this time I'm going to try to remember to cover the part of the songbook that I meant to cover last week, too. <laughs> Building up a stack, so if you want to help me someday and you see the stack getting bigger and bigger, help me redistribute. Anyway, title of the sermon today is One. And I'd like to go first to Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Think about that. How many of us are here? I think we're a very large two or three. Who else is here? I got reminded of this last week because I tried to do head counts and I'm unlike most preachers. My head counts tend to be smaller than they are. I get done doing my head count and I came up with 39 or 40. And Boone tells me it's 42. And I'm thinking to myself, how did you get that big? Oh, well, there were some in the back. And I'm thinking I knew about those. And you can't forget the one who's always here when there's at least two of us. And I'm like, I never thought about including him in the count. Thank you. And, but do we think about that? Do we think about the one who's here in our midst when we gather in his name. Matthew 4, 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And if we want to look at a passage very similar from the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 14. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now, think about what Jesus did there. When he's facing I'm sorry, face to face with Satan. When he's facing what for him is a temptation. Why did he come here? To have an impact on the whole world. What was Satan offering him? I will give you all of it. Because if you bow down and worship me, it's all mine anyway. So, you want it? I can give you the biggest piece because I got the shortcut. 
It was a temptation. Because why? Because he wanted to have the people respond. He wanted them to do the right thing. And you know what? If instead he went down there, da da da, and the huge music starts flowing and Jerusalem starts rocking, and you see the sky light up with colors you've never seen before. And then the flashy lights start pointing down at this one spot. Yeah, yeah, he's the one, he's the one. Back before TV, back before Hollywood and all that. I think everybody's going to get the idea. Yeah, he's the one, he's the one. He wanted that. But what was Jesus' answer when running face to face with Satan? with what Jesus in his own heart wanted. His answer was God. He didn't go into the battle with Satan with a different playbook. He went in to the battle with Satan with the same guidance, the same answers we do. And what did he hold up as the answer? The answer against Satan's worst was the best. The answer is God. If we jump a little bit farther forward in Matthew 15, 8 through 11. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We find here that you can't just pick and choose what you're comfortable with when it comes to drawing near to God. Jesus could have accepted that kind of help. Would there have been anything sinful about a light show? Would there have been anything sinful about the herald angels pointing down and say, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Of its own, no. Giving in and accepting Satan's answer instead of the Father's is where it would have fallen flat on its face. Why? Because it wasn't what God gave. God gave Jesus instructions, just like he gave John the Baptist instructions. You have a mission. You have a purpose. You are to go. Here's how you go. Here's the word you use. Guess what? It's the word they've been using all along. You don't give them the Jesus new book. You point back to who? To God. And you show God to be who he truly is. And because he is that answer all the way back to in the beginning. He still is the best answer when going toe-to-toe to, toe to toe with a guy with the pointy horns and the pitchfork and the tail, or whatever you want to look at him as. Because while I made a joke about that, it's so not a joke when it's a temptation I feel. The thing we got to realize with all this is where is the heart? Is the heart with what makes me feel good in coming to worship God? Or is it bringing to God what God's asked of me? Is the answer when I'm facing the worst my own answer? Or is God's answer the standard, the best, even for Jesus himself? Think about that one. And when we're talking about all this, what's in the heart and who's in our midst? And I'm not talking about Sunday morning. I'm talking about when you're sitting in a Cambodian restaurant in the scariest part of town. And okay, Gainesville's tame compared to, uh, what was it, Tupelo? This is where Bandit Keith's is. That was even a sketchier place. 
where nobody from church was probably going to catch us at Bandit Keith's. In fact, that some of them would have questioned us for walking in there. What they saw at Bandit Keith's would have been what they saw in the Cambodian restaurant. If they can't see it on Saturday night, what are they seeing Sunday morning? We need to realize there's a big difference between being worshipers and being fans. Because I'm a fan of good football. Notice I didn't say the Gators. Um, <laughs> I enjoy watching good football. Notice what I started that out with. I enjoy. Because when I'm with my family, my family, Tyler and Vicki, are extreme Gator fans. And they are rooting for the Gators no matter what they're doing on that field. I already told you what I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of good football. I'm watching how the center's performing. I was a center when I played football. I'm watching how the defensive and offensive line is performing. I played guard when I played football. But what happens the day after? Well, the day after, you're going to hear Tyler grumbling if the Gators didn't perform up to his expectations. What about Monday? Well, they've probably forgotten about it. Now it's two days past. Fans are there when it's rocking and in the moment, when it makes you feel good. And yeah, I'm up because that was a cool play. I really enjoyed watching them do that. Because that showed skill, that showed determination, that showed their head was in the game, that showed. And come Monday, I probably won't be able to tell you what play I was even talking about and what were the two teams playing. Because while I might be a fan of good football, how committed is a fan really? Okay, some of them go to extremes, but what's the difference between being a fan and a worshiper? A fan is there because of what they get out of it. I really do enjoy good football. And it'll tick Tyler and Vicky off a bit. Because I'm rooting for the good football I see. There's something I'm getting out of it. There's a huge difference between me coming to get and get out of it. And worship. Worship is that kind of thing that I described earlier, except it doesn't have to be all that flash and bang. You ever hear the expression, worshiping the ground she walks on? And notice it's a she usually and not a he. Why do we say that? Because we value that person so much that the ground that holds them up is almost sacred to us. Because we are thankful that the ground was there to hold them up. We're thinking about the qualities of that person that make them awesome. Did I say anything about what I got from that person? No. The reason we use that expression is because we see in another person qualities that we think are just so, so great. Do they have to do anything for us, for us to say they're that kind of awesome person? Not really. I didn't start dating Vicki because she did all these great things for me. I didn't watch the way she interacted with other people and say, oh, because she's done all these things for me, therefore that's the kind of person I would like to go out with and eventually marry. And okay, yeah, I'm the one of the crazy guys that picked out the people I was willing to marry long before I was able to date them. I just said, that person I'm not going to go out with because I wouldn't consider ever marrying them. They don't have the right kind of qualities. Worship isn't about a what I get out of it. It's about recognizing the awesome beyond belief that exists 
that no matter what good I may or may not receive, that's still awesome beyond belief. And the cool thing is with God, in the beginning, God. And then he starts listing off, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Before we're here, before we're even conceived, what is God doing? He's already laying the foundation of awesome goods. How awesome? We split the atom and we're still here. We knocked the atom bomb a couple times. We're still here. We got the diseases. We're still here. We've done a whole lot of stupid. And we're still here. Why? Because God's good is greater than our mess up. God has shown himself again and again in ways great and powerful. Take a look at the universe. We can't fathom its bigness. I don't care if you give the examples of how many earths would fit inside the sun and how many suns would fit inside of a clock. Who cares? Because the truth is I can't envision how big the earth is. I have problems visioning the distance it is from here to Gainesville because you know what? I can't see that. I can see it on a Google map or something like that. But that distance is beyond me. What I can relate to is love. God put it in this world in so many different ways. It's like a fingerprint. You know those little itty bitty ridges when you see it when they do? Oh, crime type of thing and there's those fingerprint things. God left his fingerprint on his creation in so many ways and the best part of that fingerprint in my opinion is love in all of its different aspects. He left that fingerprint on his creation to show us in a smaller way the magnitude of his love and what he's willing to do and has already done for us. When we think about worshipers, it's seeking God, as I've already said, not on my terms. Oh yes, I worship God and the way I'm going to do it today is by going out and fishing. No, that doesn't cut it because that's not what God asked for. Any more than me giving Vicky the bigger cut of steak the first five years we were married worked as far as showing her how much I loved her at dinner time. Yes, I did that, and it wasn't until I got laughed at about it in a young couples kind of group that I came to the realization I've been doing it really, really wrong, haven't I? And everybody's like smiling big time. Oh yeah, Rich, you've been messing up. Because I wasn't seeking to be pleasing to Vicky on Vicky's terms. I was trying to be pleasing to Vicky best way I knew how. Thing that I enjoyed the most in life at that time was steak and potatoes. Just, just the truth of it. And I thought I was doing great. And I was wrong. Because I wasn't seeking to be pleasing to Vicky based on Vicky. And everybody can understand, yeah, Rich, you blew it. Do we understand that when it's God? That if we are seeking God, striving to worship God, it needs to be founded in His ideas, His examples, instead of seeking self. Because the truth is, a big part of why I was giving her that bigger cut of steak is I'm showing you how much I love you, hoping you're going to show me how much you love me. Because truth is, what's a lot of our love? I'm hoping I get back some of what I'm showing. Because we're missing the mark. And we have to learn and grow. Because when we show love to kids, and I'm talking about when their babies and their diapers stink to high heavens. I got what we used to jokingly call sewer detail. Because when it smelled like the worst sewage you ever heard, oh yes, it was definitely my turn to change the diaper. Bilge water, that was the other word I used to use for it. When you're talking about the bilge water diaper changing time, 
Anybody here get a really great, good feeling about changing the real nasty stinkies? I didn't, especially when the goofball would put their hand down and it and fling it. In which case, I really didn't. I wasn't committed to the good of the experience of changing the diaper. I was committed to the good of doing good regardless of when the poo was flying. <laughs> you hear the goofiness of that. It's not goofy when we're trying that with God. Trying to do what we think is right based on what I would want is not trying to do good based on what he wants. When we come together, and I'm trying to push through real quick, and I'm probably not gonna get through all my slides. If worship is what I get out of it, am I worshiping? Or am I fanboying it up? Truth is, I'm not worshiping. Because if the measure of how worshipful the worship service was, was how much I got out of it. Does worshiping the ground somebody walks on sound like I'm getting a whole lot or I'm giving a whole lot because of how high I hold that person up? I used to buy artworks for one of my girlfriends because she liked Yadro. Yadro way back when was cheaper than it is now. So I could buy Yadro pieces for $100 to $300 to $400. Today, you'd buy them for thousands of dollars. I bought that for her because I valued her as an individual that much. When I bought the diamond ring for Vicky for our um, engagement, you better believe I was arguing with the person across the counter from me, not because I wanted to get the biggest bang for the buck. I wanted to get the purest looking diamond I could find. Why? Not that it mattered how big the rock was on her finger because it's not a huge rock. Not because it mattered whether or not it shined with all the colors or if it was yellowish or whatever. I wanted that rock to be as pure as I could afford it to be because of my dedication to her. And if it was loaded with flaws, I didn't want that to be a reminder of how flawed I am to begin with. I wanted to give to her, gift to her, a value that at that time I felt was worth a whole lot more than me. Worship isn't what I get out of it. Worship is what I'm offering to God. It's how I'm able to come to a congregation, I'm not pointing the finger here, and have it be a joyful noise coming out of what's up front. I've even been in charge of selecting some of those joyful noisers. And I'd rather have a joyful noise up front who's given their all to God than have the guy that's got the tuning fork and directing it perfectly. Every note is perfect. It's flawless. He's got the tempo exact. He's memorized every song in the book. He knows all the verses and it is done perfectly. It's not about him. It's about what's going on inside of me. So it doesn't matter if he's perfect or if he's energetic for God. Yes, it does. Because if he's energetic for God, so am I. It's not about how flashy the guy is up front. It's about God. It's about bringing to God, bringing our focus, bringing our heart to God. Because, oh, by the way, he's the one next to you. not just Sunday. Even in the Cambodian restaurant. Because is worship confined to Sunday morning? 
Real worship isn't like being a fan. I don't turn it off when I turn off the TV set. I don't turn it off a couple days later because I really didn't pay a lot of attention to the game. You don't turn off worship. Because when is God less than God? He's not. Jumping back into the Old Testament. Psalms 122 verses 1 through 9. I'm probably not going to get it all the way. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Think about that. Wasn't I was glad because of the singing I was going to get to hear. Wasn't glad because of the show I was going to get to watch. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes grow up and the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. What part of what I got out of it is there in what we just read? How uplifted, how awesome does it sound when people are giving thanks to the Lord? As far as like when you hear a beautiful song and you're going, oh yeah, that's really nice. Do we get that? Yeah, that's really nice feeling out of giving thanks to the Lord. No. Because that's not worship. It's not what worship's about. Because what are we focusing there on again? Me. Did I feel inspired? Did I feel uplifted? Did I feel challenged? Did I? I, I, I. <clears throat> Worship's about God. Worship isn't about just when we come Sunday morning. It's about who we're becoming. Christian, Christ-like. If they can't see it in the restaurant, is what they're seeing Sunday morning the real thing? It's about making the intentional, purpose-driven choice. Because let's turn around one that's really, really wrong, and let's make it a really, really right. One of the faculty I used to know, he's passed now, took his kids to church because he wanted them to learn the right kind of values. What did he do? He wanted them to learn. Was he going to get the right thing out of church? No. Because it wasn't about God. It was about what he was going to get out of it for his kids, about what he was going to get out of it for his family. That's the wrong perspective. Now, let's turn it around and make it right. If he came to worship God and he brought his family with him to worship God and he showed his family based on God's standard what it meant to worship God, not just Sunday morning, but with every ounce and fiber of his being every day. So that when he was in the restaurant, they go, wow, that's a good man. Not because I had a cross around my neck, not because we sang hymns and broke out the Bible, but because what they saw, how will they know they're Christians? By their love. Couldn't deny that family there. When we seek to put God where he belongs in our lives, then our kids are going to have that right example. Our families are going to grow stronger in God's right example. But if you try to turn it the other way around, I guarantee you it will fail. Because when it stops working or looks like it's not working with the kids or work, looks like it's not working with the wife, what do you do then? 
I go looking for a better answer. Because it was never about God to begin with. It was about the better I wanted. There's a reason why the song we sang tonight, uh, tonight. I say tonight because it came upon a midnight clear. And I'm flipping back. That was uh, 995. We have a problem. And this is because we don't know the word the way we used to know it. The word in the Bible that we use for angels is the word messenger. It could mean both. Who is God's messenger today? Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the messenger's strain have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. Because are those messengers heralding the newborn king for 2,000 years? Or is there another set of messengers that have been proclaiming the same thing for over 2,000 years? And men at war with men hear not the love song which they bring. Who is still bringing that message today and why? Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the messengers sing. Nobody in the world is going to believe you when they say, oh yeah, we hear the angels. Because I don't hear the angels. Who are they going to hear? Who are they going to see? Who are they going to respond to as having the love of God in them? Those who worship God. We make a choice. We make a choice because sitting right next to us right now is the Son of God. Or standing beside me. When we go out into that world, even though we don't have a scripture saying it, who knows what I'm doing 24-7? God does. Just like he's standing there beside me. What difference should that have in my life? Should I be recognizing him even more so than the woman who I worship the ground she walks on. And I don't mean that in the wrong way. I mean I respect everything that goes on right in this life relative to Vicki. And I know that it's because of God that anything is going to go right. And I am so thankful to God that that ground is there to hold her up some days because I can't do a good enough job of holding her up myself sometimes when she faces the worst. We need to work with the understanding. We're here for God, not for me. That when we come together, we are bringing worship to God. Because the truth is, if I want that right family, if I want that right relationship with my wife, if I want things to go right at work, it all starts with going right with God on God's terms. Because he's the one that's going to bless my family, going to bless my wife, going to bless my job going to bless all that I do if I have made him God in my life. He's that number one. <coughs> or he's not that number one and I'm only talking a good game. He called us by his goodness from the beginning whether that be the little boy who grew to be a man who went to Calvary. And the cool thing about that, and I love the fact that it was brought up as part of communion. We don't think about it, but I looked it up. It was numbers, because I've been cruising through the Bible recently. As far as I'm cruising, I'm going at 1.5 speed and listening to it while I'm doing my daily part. I'm also listening to the whole Bible too. And I went cruising through Numbers and it's like, oh, there it was, the star. <laughs> numbers 24, 17, I believe, is the passage where it talks about, and up from Jacob shall rise a star, and the scepter shall not depart from his feet. 
It's not just a hope. There is reason to worship God because of all that he's done from the beginning showing not just his love, his power and authority. And I don't mean in the miraculous. I mean in the bare simple truth that this world is still here today. That's an awesome that in the beginning God created. We worship God because of the good he's done, the good he's going to continue to do, not because I'm going to receive, but because God is good, period. And because of that, we can follow the example of his son, taking him on in baptism, and then choosing daily to strive to be the person that when the cook looks over and goes, whoa, you are a good man. No, I'm not. I'm reflecting the example I was given by his son. If you need to take on Christ in baptism or you need the prayers of the church, you're welcome to come as we stand and sing.